Hi moms and welcome. I am so happy that you're joining us today and I know that we're going to learn a lot from our guest from Hunter Clark Fields and we're going to talk about how we can become less reactive and calmer parents, how to be more present when our kids are struggling and have big emotions, how to take a mindful approach to problems, and actually use conflict to create a connection with our tweens and teens. Hunter is an expert on that and what we can do to strengthen our relationship with our kids. Hunter is a mindfulness mentor. She's the host of the, of the Mindful Mama podcast, creator of the Mindful Parenting course, and author of an awesome book, Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. So welcome, Hunter. I am so happy that you are joining us today. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you started down this path. Well, the sort of short answer is that I had like a really difficult kid, <laughs> you know, who's like incredibly sensitive and d challenging. And I was like, why is it so hard? You know, I think just, I think is a question we all ask, but the longer story is starts when I was little and I had those big up and ups and downs and I was a highly sensitive kid and I would get into these pits of despair and you know just was like this highly sensitive person I started studying about mindfulness as a teenager just wanting some relief and finally as I practiced uh 10 years later I finally sat down to do it and lo and behold that's actually a lot more effective than reading about it. <laughs> and, um, and I had some big transformations for me. I, I stopped falling into these pits that I would fall into every couple of weeks. And, and it was hugely transformative. And so then when I was going to go have my children, I had like, you know, I was like meditating while I had this big pregnant belly. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to be so calm. And my, you know, as with a, a newborn, your practice falls by the wayside a bit, but, but really like my temper came out and my temper was my biggest teacher. And it really, I really realized like I had to kind of double down on my mindfulness practice to really dive in more deeply and um, bring it more fully integrated into my life. And I also needed to kind of understand, you know, I started to see that like <clears throat> I was playing out a generational pattern. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my big feelings were, you know, when my daughter had a big tantrum, like it felt completely unacceptable to me, you know, completely. And I just like had this feeling like this is unacceptable, like, ah, uh, and it was really visceral. And I, and I could really see that like, oh, when I was a kid, this is what, uh, you know, these, I was taught that my big feelings were unacceptable by my dad's rage and, and difficulty. And so that was really kind of ingrained in my bones. And now I'm perpetuating the same problem. I'm scaring my child by yelling because I have that same feeling. And so I could really see that this was like a pattern that needed to be healed and changed. And so I started to say, okay, instead of like lying here crying on the floor <laughs> feeling pathetic and helpless and like I'm a terrible mother I've got to do something like I've got to make some change and so I started to really um, dive more deeply into mind mindfulness practice um, learned about how it helps the brain and all of those things and also at the same time started to learn um, skillful communication because you know one without the other is not enough, right? Like you, it's great to like be able to remain calm and that's essential and vital and really, really important. But then if you say something that's like kind of unskillful that your parents might've said to you, like it kind of sets off that time bomb of your, you know, at yeah. least in my case is highly sensitive child again. And, you know, I can't access that skillful communication unless I can calm myself around down and access my whole brain, which the mindfulness really does on the other side. So that's really uh, what started the journey of, of wanting to learning and training and et cetera. Yeah, you were living, you are now 
teaching what you have personally lived out in your own life and the Absolutely. transformation that's happened in your life and, and parenting. And I really loved your book. I can say this with all honesty. It's one of the best parenting books I've read. And it reminded me a little bit of Dan Siegel's book. And I know I saw that you had interviewed him, Inside Out Parenting. But what I love about your book is you really drilled it down. It is so understandable, the concepts doable. It, it really resonated. And I highly recommend you moms, we're gonna share that at the end, get her book because it is all about, you talk about healing and not passing down those generational patterns that we grew up with and how do we break that? Because we can say, like you said, this is what you need to do and teach all those communication skills, which we need. But if we're not parenting from the inside out and starting with ourselves, it's really difficult to do that. Yes. It's like slapping a Band-Aid on a gushing wound. And yeah. so you broke your book into two parts. So mm -hmm. I want you to talk about that. You've touched on it a little bit. You broke it into the inner work and the outer work, mm -hmm. which I love. And you start with telling us about the inner work, which so many parenting books don't talk about, and how it's the foundation. Can you talk about the inner work? Where do we start? Oh, that's a... It's so important. I mean, yeah, because I remember thinking like, but how, how do you do these things? How do you just respond this way? Like, I would love to just respond this way, but I can't because I've got all these <laughs> intense things going on for me, you know, and, and parenting is, brings up so much, right? It's like physically challenging, psychologically challenging, like you're, you're not getting enough sleep, you know, and the thing is like, you know, you're back in that parent-child relationship and thing, you're, thing, the, things are brought up that have maybe little to do with your, your child actually in that moment and have a lot more to do with your own past and the baggage you're carrying. Um, you know, we talk about being triggered and there's, you know, when, you know, it, it's like, or you're pushing my buttons, right? Like, well, where did these buttons come from? <laughs> like, why are these your buttons? So we want to kind of unpack that and say, like, ha A, have the awareness, start to have more awareness of ourselves and lower our reactivity, right? So this is the, the inner work is like, there's two people in a relationship. And uh, the one thing we can know for sure, sure, sure in parenting is that it's, oh, there's so much about modeling, right? Like our kids, if we're yelling at our kids, our kids are going to yell back at us. And so we have to look at like, well, why are, why are we having a tantrum when our child has a tantrum, right? Like, why am I saying to my child, you know, you behave so that I can feel better? you do what I want you to do so that I can, I can feel better. I can't control my own feelings. Your behavior is what totally. controls my own feelings. I, like, so why are we saying that to our children? Like there's a lot of work to look at our own reactivity. Like if we can start to step back and, and lower that reactivity, like that's so much of the problem is that we're just kind of on this sort of like autopilot. We're just reacting, reacting, reacting. And so that's where that mindfulness work comes from. Self-compassion is a big part of that inner yeah. work mm -hmm. because you're going to fail. You're going to mess up. Yeah. You're not going to just say, I'm going to decide to respond, to use iMessages with my child and like do it perfectly all the time. That's not going to happen. Like we're going to mess up and we're going to fail. So how do we treat ourselves when we mess up? matters a whole lot, it turns out. If you're mean and harsh and judge yourself really harshly when you fail, you're actually going to feel really debilitated and unable to take steps outside your comfort zone that are required to grow and learn. But if when you take steps outside of your comfort zone and you fail, you respond with a softer landing, you know, you give yourself a softer landing, you tell yourself, yeah, it's hard. It sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people feel this way, a lot of people are suffering in this way, then you say, okay, well, it's not about me. There's, you know, this is hard. And you can then take those steps to do something different, go outside your comfort zone. And so that piece is so, so important. And then how to take care of our difficult feelings, right? Like we're telling our kids, like, 
you know, we, we don't want them to explode and be angry and be super sad and have all these things. Like we're giving them inadvertently a lot of times the same messages that were given to us, which is just don't have those feelings, which is crazy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? So we yeah. have to model how to take care of those feelings. And there's a, a middle path for that, right? Between blocking them out and then just drowning them. So yes. it's, these are just essential life skills in a lot of ways. So many of us grew up with, I think the majority of stuff it, you know, mm -hmm. like stuff down those feelings. And then of course we don't learn how to manage our anger. If, if that was not okay in our family or if anger was scary and mm -hmm. so just stuff it, stuff it, don't have those feelings. But I love how you talk about like noticing those triggers. Can you get an example of what was, you made that connection with your father and how that was playing out but what was one of those messages for you? One of those triggers to give an example? Oh, um, you know, I could, I've discovered many triggers over the years. <laughs> and still learning. Still learning. I <laughs> yeah. found one just a few months ago. Um, but yeah, so one of them was like the, the, you know, don't be, don't be upset. Don't be, don't yell and things like that. One of them for me was not being, uh, it's a big one, big common one is not being listened to as like the youngest child in the family. <laughs> no one wanted to listen to, you know? So it's like, if you're not listening to me, it's like, what? Rah, you know, that you was You've got like, a teenager now, a tween and teen, right? Yes, yeah, I do have a teen, <laughs> teen. Oh boy, you're right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've been thinking about that. My oldest daughter is 13 now and She's wonderful to be around at this point. She was so hard. She was the one who was the catalyst for like all this work. And I really feel grateful because I really do believe that teens are not rebelling against parents. I mean, they do separate, yes, but they're rebelling against destructive parenting techniques that just push kids away, that just you know lead to so much resentment over time that we lose our influence. You know, I think that's what happens um, with adolescents. And right now, like, it's good for me and my teen. I feel very grateful. Yeah. Before, um, I think that connects with that control. Like, we want to control it, but we really, and then we feel powerless, and then we're reacting out of that, that powerless feeling. And yeah. that doesn't go so well versus listening. You talk a lot about using conflict for connection and how to how to listen and how powerful that is talk about how we can actually use which is so um counterintuitive use conflict for connection with our kids sure i mean any unresolved conflicts they can really breed they can get really dicey right like because kids tend to if we don't talk about our conflicts kids tend to like blame themselves for these things. Like if we're not kind of processing these things, kids tend to blame themselves for what's happening and, or they can, they can breed resentment for their parent. And um, so it, a lot of us, especially I think sometimes people who are drawn, drawn to mindfulness or we, some people are, you know, we, we want to avoid conflict. We want peace. We want ease in our lives and we want to have loving relationships with our kids. But Conflict is a natural human part of life that if we can accept that, it, it makes it like we have less resistance and difficulty around conflict in general. But conflict with our kids, like we really, what I've really learned is that, you know, we have needs and our kids have needs, right? All, all conflict is usually is that I have this need and you have this need at this point. And these needs are kind of overlapping with each other and causing a problem, right? So what can we figure out like, what are you needing? What am I needing? Can we be honest with our kids and say, hey, when you talk to me in that way, like say your kid's giving you a kind of mean, nasty teen attitude, that really hurts my feelings. I feel sad mm -hmm. when you talk to me that way. And we can be honest about how those, how um, open ourselves up to those sort of vulnerabilities in some ways then our ch we can get past the sort of role, right? Of like mother or child or father and child and into like, 
I'm a human being, you're a human being, like this is when that, when you do that, this is what's going on for me and this is how it affects my life. Then our kids can, you know, see us and, and, it, and, it, and have that empathy for us and vice versa. If when we can start to sometimes with our teens, like we have an agenda, right? Like yeah. you're coming yeah. to this thing, no matter what. And because family is important, you have to be there, blah, blah, blah. And we don't listen to hear the other side. We don't sit, we don't try to understand. And um, yeah, sometimes my teen says to me, can you, can you listen? And I say, oh, that's like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> okay, let me stop. Let me listen. And then when we can, t you know, show our kids that we really hear them and really, really try to hear them, be open-minded, hear what they're saying, then they give us more respect and more, um, more empathy and care in general if we give it to them. It's crazy how it works like that. You know, it really does work when we can learn how to do that, I have found. And, and I want to give everybody hope that's listening. I want to quote you. Anger, and I could have written this. It was when I read this. Anger would well up like I hadn't felt since I was a child. Before I did the excavation work to understand what was triggering me, I blamed my daughter. What's wrong with her? Why won't she listen to me? It was clearly all her problem. If I could fix her behavior, that everything would be better, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, yes. I mean, how many of us can feel that way? And you talk about name it to tame it. Mm -hmm. And so to explain that, maybe some of our listeners have heard that, but explain what that means. Yeah, uh, Dan Siegel talks about this, and and it really is part of the brain. Like, so these upper parts of our brain, the the prefrontal cortex, are the higher, later evolved parts of our brain, right? That are unique to human beings. We have the verbal ability in there, and things like that. And when uh, parents ask me a lot, like, okay, so how can I slow down my yelling? How can I stop yelling? And part of it is this name it to tame it um, strategy, because what happens is we're like. I'm going to be the mindful parent. I'm mindful. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. But at this, but we're really not. We're like kind of fake calm, and we're we're just like gritting our teeth and trying. And then it gets to the point where we just like poof, explode, right? And that's not such a great strategy because we're trying to kind of suppress what's happening. We're not really acknowledging what's really happening for us. And so, name it to tame it ask you just simply to like name what's going on earlier in that timeline. So you're starting, you know, I'm starting to get frustrated. I'm starting to feel really irritated because of X, Y, Z. And then when we do that, we are verbally, we're integrating the verbal parts of our brain. We're integrating upper brain and lower brain, left brain and right brain. And we're, so which is lowering our own stress response, providing us some relief, but it's also like uh, telling our kids what's going on for them, for, you know, for us. And they, so they can see, oh, whatever's happening, mom's starting to feel irritated. It can, it can help them to regulate their own behaviors and, and things too, you know, along that line. Um, and it's also what it's also doing is modeling good emotional regulation for your kids. So if you can say out loud, oh, I'm starting to feel irritated. You're not like a bad parent because you feel irritated. You're human. And if you can say that out loud, you're showing your kids like what it is like to take care of feelings. And if you're starting to like, oh, I'm feeling really irritated. Now I'm feeling really frustrated. And that can be a, a sign of like, oh, let me do something about this. Let me take some steps yeah. to help to reduce my stress response and to check myself, check my mood, do some deep, slow breaths, which are cliche because they work to, you know, <laughs> shift our body out of this stress response into the rest, relax response. Um, you know, it, it's a sign for you to take care of yourself and to turn things around in that way. I love that because it's, I think we're prone to say you, you know, you stop doing it, this, you stop doing that blaming or pointing the finger versus saying, I'm feeling like I found that was a really good way to start practicing this. Like I'm noticing I'm starting to feel upset, frustrated. It's a way in, but it's not blaming your child. 
And like you said, it's helping them to become more self-aware. Yeah. And that is where the feelings really do create that connection that you're talking about in the midst of conflict, because then you can seek to understand. And I, I, love, I love how you share that in the book. It just makes so much sense. And that piece I wanted to just kind of go back because I don't think I said that fully when you asked about conflict bringing us together and is that that piece about like us uh, apologizing to our kids, us saying like, hey, I'm sorry. I, sh I wish I could rewind and say that in another way. And I wasn't very skillful there. You know, we don't need to be hard on ourselves, but I wasn't very skillful there. And this is what I would have liked to say. And, you know, I really love you, honey, and all of those things. That's like that rupture and repair that researchers talk about and that really does like bring us together where our kids see oh our my parent really does care about me we're modeling how to um how to repair a relationship and it really gives our kids more respect for us rather than less to to make an, a good sincere apology yeah i love that yeah and then they'll come back and they do it because you've taught them how to model it mm -hmm. exactly I love how you talk about um, yelling purposefully or skillfully. <laughs> I was like, we don't have to do away with yelling altogether, but we can do it skillfully. Tell, tell our listeners about that. Sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, it might be great to like never yell again, but it's kind of crazy. Like who, that's, that's just not human nature. Most people uh, yell once in a while, and especially if you had a loud household. But anyway, yeah, we can, we can yell more skillfully. We can work to yell a lot less. And, you know, I talk about like a yell less formula in, in Raising Good Humans and how to do that. But uh, I think a, a great step in that is yelling more skillfully. <laughs> so when I, dis I discovered uh, my, the last trigger I discovered was like a few months ago. And my 10-year-old uh, daughter like was, didn't want to go to bed. It had been movie night. We were all had a nice time and then she started like laughing at me and I was like, <laughs> it's like I, I was responding unskillfully and then I just said I'm really angry right now I need to go take a break and that's a way of yelling skillfully is if you can yell I'm really angry if you can yell I need to go take a break that's fine like yeah you might you know you might be trigger a little of that fear response in your kid from raising your voice, but hey, it's better than blaming language, et cetera. Like if you can, you know, then you can come back and do that repair after. But um, yeah, I could really feel that heat of my anger and I'm really angry. <laughs> it's a great skillful way to yell. <laughs> and how, what was the outcome? How did that, how did that go? Oh my goodness. I might, I had gotten so hot from that. I had to walk up and down the street for about 20 minutes. And uh, I think by that time she had gone to sleep. And then the next morning I said, wow, you know, I was really angry last night, wasn't I? And they were like, yeah, you were <laughs> really angry. And I said, I think that I felt, you know, and then we talked about the situation a little bit more and, and uh, I did apologize for yelling and it, it worked out. <laughs> and what it, and, and including her and what happened? with you so she can understand how she impacts you too. yeah exactly and other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like good feedback too mm -hmm. to yeah kids, when we can tell them how we feel but you also talk about the outer work and we touched on this a little bit but those communication skills can you um is there anything that you feel like you would like to add that we didn't we didn't cover yeah i think um one of the biggest, most important communication skills is not to speaking and listening. <laughs> and, um, and we talked a little bit about listening, but um, when we can really pause and really listen and really try to understand, and part of that goes back to that, the mindfulness pieces of practicing to be uh, non-judgmental, to notice those thoughts that are arising, to keep our attention here on what your child is saying, what your child is not saying, staying in that place of curiosity rather than kind of an autopilot or a labeling place. Then we can start to see our children with fresh eyes. And um, so I think listening and also like reflecting back is an incredibly um, powerful skill. And then when we talk about our speaking, 
speaking from our own experience, we use iMessages, I'm feeling this. Um, I wanna offer a little tip in that. If you're ever saying, I feel like you are, that's like a you message disguised as an I message. I feel like you are being selfish, right? Like that's a big one. I feel like you're being selfish. That's that's not so skillful. You know, what what are you really feeling? And and part of that takes a moment of pause and a moment of what is really going on for me. You know, if if there's anger, what's below the anger? You know, if, if I'm angry at you, I might actually be really sad and hurt underneath that anger. So um, I guess I'm kind of pointing back to the inner work, but it really is sort of interconnected, I suppose. Yeah. And can you think when you were so triggered by your daughter that when she started laughing and you were angry, what was underneath that? Yeah, that was a tough one. You know, I'm, I'm a little, I'm still a little um, perplexed at why the laughing, I mean, maybe it felt like mocking and, yeah. um, you know, uh, childhood, childhood stuff like that, that, that it really was kind of a, it was kind of a, a thing for me. Well, thank you everybody that joined us and you have to check out Hunter, uh, listen to her podcast. It's wonderful. She actually, you even do, uh, meditations. Are you still doing that on your podcast? Not as much, but during when the COVID-19 outbreak, the pandemic started, I people really needed some anxiety reduction. So I did the daily dose, which is a five minute meditation, a little suggestion for mindful uh, living and mindful parenting uh, for like 24 days or something like that. Yeah, so they can access it because I, I was actually listening to them and <laughs> breathing <laughs> along with you and they're very doable and, and not, not too long. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you for that. So Mindful Mama podcast, her book, Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. And tell them your website one more time. Mindfulmamamentor.com. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Hunter, so much for being here. Thank I you so much, Cheryl. Great to connect with you. Yes. So I hope to connect with you soon. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Talk to you later. Great. Bye. -bye. Bye.